Not all fetal bradycardia requires emergent delivery. Most fetuses with bradycardia will not experience a complete cessation of oxygen during the intrapartum period and instead experience a short or intermittent reduction. If after transport to the OR the bradycardia resolves, the decision to deliver should be reevaluated. Simply moving a patient to the OR should not be a fait accompli that delivery is required. Unfortunately, there are no reliable indicators that distinguish fetal bradycardia that will be fatal from those that are transient and ultimately harmless. There is, however, evidence to suggest that certain bradycardia, particularly those that first appear in the second stage, may be different from bradycardia that occurs remote from delivery. Late in the second stage of labor, it is not uncommon for patients to have prolonged decelerations and end-stage bradycardia, which are likely the result of head compression as the fetal vertex descends into the pelvis and is further compressed during pushing. It appears to be that these end-stage bradycardia, presumably from head compression, are more benign than those resulting from cord occlusion. And a more conservative management approach to these bradycardia in the second stage of labor may be considered. In this case, delivery was accomplished with an APGAR score of 9 and 9, an umbilical cord gases of a CUA of 7.10, 66, 18, and minus 6, and a CUV of 7.35, 33, 23, and minus 5. Supporting these findings, a study that looked at acid accumulation in term fetuses with second stage bradycardia found that the fetus most likely to become acidemic will lose its fetal heart rate variability during the bradycardia for a total of more than four minutes or lose its variability in less than three minutes from the beginning of the bradycardia. In addition, the loss of variability was found to be more predictive of a severe acidosis than was the length of the bradycardia. By taking into account the degree of variability that is retained during the second stage bradycardia, providers may better determine the time frame within which delivery should occur. And as a general guideline, as long as moderate variability is retained, the patient can be allowed to continue pushing and attempt a vaginal delivery. Preparation should be in place to rescue the fetus if the situation changes. Now, fetal heart rate tracing with absent variability and a persistent pattern of recurrent deceleration deserves consideration for rapid delivery. A crash cesarean section may be considered if these patterns present upon immediate placement of the fetal heart rate monitor. Because the evolution of the tracing is unknown to the provider, these findings may have resulted from a relative prolonged period of asphyxia prior to surveillance rather than the acute hypoxia of shorter duration. In this case, delivery occurred 72 minutes after admission with a baby delivered with an APGAR score of 1, 3, and 8. Umbilical cord gases, CUA of 6.77, 76, 11, and minus 17, and a CUV of 7.05, 59, 21, and minus 13. Even when the provider has had the opportunity to observe the evolution of the pattern, particularly the loss of the fetal heart rate variability over time, it is still reasonable to consider that the fetus with this tracing pattern is at risk for asphyxia should the pattern remain unchanged. Preparations for immediate delivery should be initiated. If the pattern subsequently improves, evidenced by a restoration of fetal heart rate variability and a decrease in the depth of the decelerations, continued observation may again be considered. This case resulted in a vaginal delivery of a 3589 gram female, APGAR scores of 7 and 8, with umbilical cord gases of a CUA of 7.07, 70, 10, and minus 9, and a CUV of 7.13, 57, 15, and minus 7. The ability to deliver a fetus emergently is one of those moments in time where all our skills really make a difference. The rapidity with which the OB team is mobilized and the effectiveness of the rescue efforts are linked to the degree of collaborative practice that has been established. Industries with high reliability and performance and low rates of accident resulting in harm have long recognized that superb individual skills do not guarantee the degree of team performance essential during emergent events. Critical events training in which doctors, midwives, nurses, scrub techs, anesthesiologists, and pediatricians train together to improve their ability to manage emergent events can reduce the likelihood that an adverse event will result in patient harm. Lastly, improving communication and teamwork is particularly important in labor and delivery where a high rate of adverse events increases the risk for serious injury. The unique conditions of each unit environment and unit culture that impedes our ability to respond to emergent events needs to be identified and corrected. 
And by doing so, we can take care of our patients consistent with their condition and be better prepared to take action in a time frame in keeping with the urgency of the situation.